Okay, this is Mark again, and we're continuing in our series on um, systematic theology, and um, particularly in our series on the Word of God, and um, just as the doctrine of God, there's um, the attributes of God, well, so uh, theologians have talked about the attributes of Scripture, and um, the attribute of Scripture that I want to look at tonight is the necessity of God's Word. And um, when we talk about God's Word being necessary, what we mean is something very simple, and that is we need it. <laughs> we really do need it. So that's what we're going to discuss tonight, is the necessity of God um, not remaining silent, but speaking to us. And in that regard, I'd like to quote from my denomination's um, confession, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the very first statement. It reads like this. Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men unexcusable, yet are they not sufficient to give the knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, which makes the Holy Spirit to be most necessary, those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people uh, now being now ceased. So the confession here establishes the necessity of Scripture based on the insufficiency of other forms of revelation uh, to give the knowledge of salvation. And uh, what the confession is spe specifically <laughs> referring to is what theologians call um, general revelation. That is what we get from nature. And it's general in the sense as far as its audience and as far as its content. But um, as uh, scripture says, um, it instead of being leading to the knowledge of salvation, it leads to the knowledge of damnation. Um, Romans 1.18. And in that regard, I wanted to read from um, Jonathan Edwards. Um, a brief quote about even if nature did reveal God's intention that would not change man's hostile attitude towards God and revelation but here is this quote um, quote I am of the mind that mankind would have been like a parcel of beasts with regard to their knowledge in all important truths if there never had been any such thing as revelation in the world, that is the Bible, and that they never would have risen out of their brutality, none ever came to tolerable notions of divine things unless by the revelation contained in the scriptures. Um, so, that's... <laughs> kind of the blunt way that, um, that he puts it, and it's so true. Um, you know, there's a general way in which we need God's Word, uh, and that is just the fact that uh, not only did he create the world, but he upholds the world moment by moment. But in addition, you know, we've talked about the Lord and the fact that the way he interacts with us is um, through a covenant. And, uh, you know, the new covenant. And so the written word is necessary for our relationship with God as our covenant Lord. And this covenant is a verbal 
relationship, among other things. And without the Lord's words, the Word, the Bible, uh, there's no covenant authority. Uh, in fact, there's no covenant. You know, um, obey my voice and keep my covenant are parallel expressions in Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 33. And the Ten Commandments are known as the words of the covenant in Exodus 34. And I'd like to quote, if I may, from um, Deuteronomy 4.13. And again, this is showing the necessity of the Word of God as far as um, our covenant relationship with, with God and the Lord. Um, Deuteronomy 4.13. Um, and he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you per to perform. That is the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. So you can see that the Ten Commandments is the covenant itself. Um, so if there's no written covenant words, there is no covenant, nor is there any covenant of Lord. You know, um, people. Uh, let me quote from John Frame here. He says, People often claim to have a personal relationship to Christ while being uncertain about the role of Scripture in that relationship. But the relationship that Christ has established with his people is a covenant relationship and therefore a verbal relationship, among other things. Jesus' words today are found only in Scripture. So, if we are to have a covenant relationship with Jesus, we must acknowledge Scripture as His Word. No Scripture, no Lord. No Scripture, no Christ. And no Scripture, no salvation. Salvation is a work of God's covenant lordship in which the Lord intervenes to deliver His people. And, and uh, the point being is, you know, we talked in another segment about how you know, there's a common saying that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, you can flip that around in this context, and that is that um, a word or a group of words can be worth a thousand pictures because the events of the cross of Christ and his resurrection, without the words describing their meaning, um, well, they would be without meaning. So, um, the Word of God is necessary to explain uh, the events or acts of God and um, the out, outflowing of the drama of redemption, as well as um, Him being the covenant Lord. So, having said that, there's another way of um, talking about the necessity of scripture, and, and I like to use this analogy in emphasizing the importance of the need for God speaking to us. And I was trying to imagine a chief in the interior of Africa, in the deepest regions deepest, darkest regions of Africa in which this tribe had never seen a white man, never seen any form of technology. And one day, uh, a helicopter full of guys come and they whisk the chief away from this tribe. And they bring him to downtown New York City, to Manhattan, and drop him off um, in the middle of rush hour and leave him by himself. Now, what do you think his visceral gut emotional reaction is going to be standing there on the corner of there in Manhattan at rush hour. He's going to be confused. He's going to be frightened. I mean, he is bereft of everything that is known to him. 
not only is he separated from everything that's known to him, he is immersed into a world that is totally bizarre to anything that he has experienced. And he's just been thrust into a, a strange new world. And you magnify that many, many fold. And that is the situation for any human being that's born into this world that has no knowledge of, of scripture and um, they are left basically in the same state. Um, I know there's coping mechanisms and I did it when I was a non-Christian but I I guess I've been a Christian so long I I, uh, I don't understand how non-Christians can get up, even get out of bed in the morning, um, not knowing really who, who they are and, um, and so on. But it truly baffles me because if that, if that chief was flipping out, it's, um, it's you know, it's a picture of, um, of our total lostness without God having spoken to us and that's the necessity of him speaking to us in order for us to understand the world that uh, that we are in and our, our place in it and it you know it reminds me of um, some of the lyrics of Jim Morrison and uh, the doors and he was known as a poet of psychic dislocation and uh, some of his songs, some of his more popular songs, but also The End, which is not as popular. Um, he really had a way of expressing the lostness of the lost and um, what, it, what it means to be thrown into the world um, like a dog without a bone, um, expressing kind of, in a way, Nietzsche's uh, conception of uh, what life would be without without God, the meanings, meaninglessness of it. But um, I like to think in in worldview terms. In fact, when I wrote my book, "Seeing Goes Through God's Eyes," I I patterned it after that. I asked. I had seven components to a biblical worldview and I asked the question how does the notion of earthbound spirit spirits fit in with the, um, each one of the components of a biblical worldview and um, it made for I think a novel novel way of dealing with that issue but the way that different folks approach uh, the world view with different questions, but the seven that I have are um, questions that comprise any world view, but uh, especially a biblical world view is first and foremost, what is ultimate reality? And secondly, what is the nature of reality? Uh, for example, is it um, just material or is it um, dual? Is there a material and invisible? Um, what is our purpose in life? Um, where is history going? What's the foundation for ethics? Um, what's the nature of, of man, mankind? And, and then lastly, what happens to us after death, the afterlife? And without the Word of God, all seven of those questions would be unanswerable. Um, the more sensitive a person is, the more of a uh, horror of great darkness that that would be to them. Just take one, the purpose in life. I guess that's the main thing I was alluding to before when I was talking about the difficulty of getting, getting out of bed in the morning is we don't even know our real purpose in life. Why well, keep going on? Um, 
there's there's no such thing as a shallow person because we are all made in God's image, but we can certainly act shallow and including myself, we all can. But when you think of those seven components of worldview, it's utterly and absolutely necessary that God speak to us in order for us to know the answers to all those questions. My favorite book of all time from my favorite author, Francis Schaeffer, is um, he is there and he is not silent. And he is there and he does not remain silent. Um, and he, in that book, he masterfully talks in a presuppositional way about the metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical necessity of the biblical God being there and not remaining silent, or the necessity of him speaking to us. Um, he shows in a way that I never could, <laughs> just the, uh, he takes the shelter off unbelievers and exposes them to heavy weather um, in those three areas, epistemology, which has to do with how we know what we know, metaphysics, the you know, nature of reality, and then um, ethics, of course, you know, foundation for right and wrong. And he shows in a profound way uh, the, the absolute necessity for the biblical God being there and uh, not remaining silent, but um, the necessity of him speaking to us. So if you hadn't read that book, I would commend it to you. So um, we're going to continue. Um, I thought I may be combining tonight with uh, the clarity of Scripture, but I think I'll just stop there for tonight, and we'll pick up with um, the clarity of Scripture, which allows us to, and me, to not preface everything I say with, this is my opinion. You may have noticed I don't say that. <laughs> I'm old enough, and what I'm speaking to um I have what is known as cognitive cognitive rest that the things I will be speak have spoken about and will speak about are utterly true because they're based in God's word and it's a um, we can't have we can have confidence and still be humble but that's jumping ahead uh, talking about the clarity of scripture so let's pray shall we. Lord, thank you that in your kindness and love you have spoken to us, and there is certainly the necessity of you having done done so for our sake. There was no necessity on your part to do so. It was an act of grace. Um, but we bow before you and thank you that you graciously have spoken to us and given us um, words for our covenant relationship with you and explain to us all that we need to know uh, about life and godliness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.